Good day chaps. So today's video is on the ENT or the Evolutionary National Tank. This was a project undertaken in 1989 by the VS1 team at Radi, Chertsey. The design was for a tank to replace the Chieftain tank and to be superior to the Challenger in every way yet remain approximately the same size and weight class. This vehicle was to pack heavy armour, have good mobility and a colossal 140mm high powered gun. The requirement for the ENT study came about as a request from the director of the fighting vehicles establishment in 1986 under project number 7308 for a future tank to surpass all of those in service. A core design of the new vehicle was that it was to be evolutionary, not revolutionary, in both concept and production and was not constrained to using parts currently found on Challenger or Chieftain and any production was scheduled for the year 2000. The Radi team took inspiration from both the analysis on the 1982 Future Tank project, the ST4004 concept designs, future main battle tank and industrial proposals of the time to design a vehicle with the overall configurations within industrial standards as well as the favoured UK AFV practice notably a turreted vehicle with the crew under the armour, a power pack at the rear and a solid propellant main gun. While not designed to be revolutionary, the vehicle did offer some differences to the British doctrine, notably the three-man crew, autoloader and a compact power pack, which would offer improved characteristics over that of the Challenger, yet remaining the same weight class. So let's have a look at the vehicle more in depth. And for the sake of brevity in this video, we're going to break it down to three areas, firepower, mobility and protection. As well as look at a few variants. So we'll start with firepower, as this is the most controlling feature of the three in this example, affecting choices in dimensions and automotive features. The team chose to go with a 140mm weapon. Two such weapons were developed in the UK around this time and had undergone trials at the Eskimede Ranges in Cumbria. There was a high-powered rifled version and a low-pressure smoothbore version. Both guns survive today at Cranfield. There were discussions on trying to fit such guns to the Challenger under the future tank gun program, which wished to evaluate guns between 120 to 150 mm in size, either conventional, electromagnetic, such as Rosetta, or using a liquid propellant base. This gun would fire armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding saber rounds, capable of defeating any Warsaw-packed vehicle of the time. And they predicted the same results for the FST-3, aka the future Soviet tank, out to 2,000 meters. However, the 140mm case rounds designed were very long, seen here compared to 120 rounds, which was one of the major reasons the UK didn't invest too much further work into the gun as handling the round was particularly strenuous and difficult. Although tested in a mock-up, the 140mm gun and ammunition proved too large for the Challenger's loader to handle adequately. The VS1 team, therefore, chose to use a two-part munition with a wider case of 180mm in the breech and a 175mm bag charge to propel it. The projectile itself was 630mm long giving an estimated penetration of 700 to 800 millimetres. As the vehicle was a three-man design, they opted to use a carousel autoloader, which, unlike the Soviet tanks, was located lower in the vehicle, near the floor plate, which was possible due to the hull's vertical sides and the external suspension. The gun itself had 8 degrees of gun depression and 16 degrees of elevation. The UK had looked at autoloaders before. Two were made for the Challenger, the first by Ferry and the second, a carousel type by the Radi team. Both still exist at Bovington but have been kept in very poor condition over the years. The bustle loader was dropped early on as due to the size of the rounds, the capacity had been reduced from 20 rounds to 16 and the increase in armour to the bustle section was not desirable. Thus they chose to go with a carousel type with 40 rounds of ammunition. Secondary armament 
came in the form of a 7.62mm chain gun mounted coaxially and a 7.62mm pintle mounted machine gun. In a scenario where helicopters might be present, they also stated a 25mm autocannon could be fitted to the bustle side, which was demountable and could be stored for future use. However, this would lower the armour profile on that side due to the armour packs being removed. The ENT's fire control system was similar to that of Challenger's midlife improvement package. The commander had a cupola with all round sight and 10 times magnification. The gunner had a conventional day night sight as well as an auxiliary manual backup system, but the ENT could also be fitted with this superb Pantilli or panoramic thermal imager with laser integrated sight, which gave him a large view of the battlefield, 12 times magnification and slaved itself to the commander, offering him an independent thermal viewer. The final point of note for the ENT fire control system was the inclusion of an ATDT, or Automatic Target Detection and Tracking System, used to aid the crew. This used the onboard image processing system to acquire and detect targets faster than the human crew by detecting movement in its field of view, and then alerting the commander and gunner to the location and the direction of the target. It was not considered an auto-kill system, as it still required the gunner to laser target and engage it. So on to engine and power. The engine chosen was a transverse mounted Perkins CV8 at 1000 brake horsepower. The CV8 was normally rated at less than half of this power, however they felt that by adding a two-stage variable geometry turbocharger, they could increase the base horsepower when coupled to a TN55 gearbox. The team acknowledged that this provided less base output than the Perkins CV12 on Challenger with the TN37 gearbox, but felt there would still be an increase in efficiency by using a simple lay shaft transmission, which would transfer the same usable energy to the sprockets as the CV12, but took up 30% less space. VS1 made a note that if further gross horsepower was required to improve the power to weight ratio, then the CV8 could be further upgraded, or they could add a transversely mounted 90 degree V12 with some minor modifications to the hull. Cooling was provided via fans, with air passed over the engine and out of the rear louvers via an air cooling system to lower the thermal signature. These fans could be switched off and the power diverted to the sprockets for a short time to increase the direct power to mobility giving the ENT a top speed of 60 km per hour. The TN55 transmission had 8 forward gears and 4 reverse, including cooler gears, with changes made by a digitally controlled system. The suspension consisted of 7 road wheels per side with hydropneumatic suspension. Each road wheel was smaller than those on the Challenger, but the total mass of the road wheels remained the same. The tracks are a double pin, rubber bush, live track of 635mm and adjusted via hydraulic track tensioners supported by two return rollers. So, on to protection. The ENT was to have a very heavy level of protection for its period, with a 46% increase over that of Challenger versus Kinetic Energy and a 75% increase in protection from shape charge attacks. The turret front was a combination of chobham armour and explosive reactive armour, offering 700mm equivalents to the front from kinetic energy over a 60 degree area of attack, and 1100mm equivalents over an 80 degree frontal arc from heat rounds. The turret side armour was also chobham, that extended to the rear of the turret sides as opposed to the front section only found on the Challenger and then additional ERA blocks would be mounted over the side plates, offering 460mm equivalents at 90 degrees to the side. The hull armour was also suitably improved, with the same base level of protection as the turret front, although it had an increased path length to improve its effectiveness. However, like the Challenger and Challenger 2, this armour did not cover the full extent of the lower plate, coming to a stop 50cm above the hull floor. Frontal hull protection was the 700mm kinetic over the upper glassy and the top third of the lower plate 
and 1300 mm heat protection. Due to the new driver's position being offset, they did not have to worry about the driver's ingress also being a potential weak spot. The turret roof was also surprisingly thick at 225mm over the front third consisting of steel and ceramics, able to withstand attacks on mortars, light artillery and air bomblets, although this did not cover the bustle section. The last bit is of course the most vital to a tank, the squishy bits inside, or crew as they prefer to be called. The ENT had three crew, the driver was located in the front left hand corner of the hull, the commander in the turret in the left hand side of the gun and the gunner to the right hand side. Each had full NBC protection as well as thermal regulation to keep the vehicle hot or cold as needed and each could recline their chairs back further than average to allow sleep in any protracted combat. Each crew member could see what the other crew could see via a shared interface system. There were noted downsides to the ENT Particularly due to the large gun and carousel, it would be near impossible, once the hatches were down, to move from one side to the other. And also the VS-1 team moved the boiling vessel to the driver, while any proper tank should have the tea made by the loader, who won't make the rookie mistakes like adding the milk first or using the wrong tea bags. So on to variants. There were several versions of the ENT, although these came about later and tied in with other projects. The first was for an anti-aircraft system. These were drawn in 1987 by the VS-1 team as part of an air defence requirement and involved plans to rework Chieftain, Challenger and the ENT concepts into a viable platform. In the ENT's case, the carousel autoloader was removed along with the turret race and the roof raised by 18mm. The power pack was shifted further back and the fuel tanks added into panniers with the turret crew now located in the hull. Behind them was a pop-up launcher with eight Starstreak missiles in two pairs of four. A further 20 missiles were stored in the hull. The last of the variants drawn up is an anti-tank guided missile version. This had twin high-velocity missiles or Triga anti-tank guided missiles either side in pop-out launchers to supplement its firepower. As adding missiles to main battle tanks, no matter how misguided, has been a British thing for some years. The Challenger also had a similar set of plans drawn up, with either Trigat, Starstreak or a mix of both in the turret, with a dummy gun to the front. The ENT would never go into production and remained on paper only. Although the UK built a few 140mm guns, none would see production either, due to their large size and difficulty in handling, as the British would prefer to keep a manual loader over an automated system preferably to make better tea as well. Well guys, I hope you liked this entry into the list of forgotten designs and programs. If you did, give us a like and a share. It'll help this little channel grow and allow me to keep digging out new things for you. And until next time, toodle pip.